Good morning, Vision family and Vision Virtual. Pastor Jerome here. I'm so excited that you decided to join us today. Really excited to dive back into the Word of God. And uh, if you're excited for the Word, just go ahead and put in the comments, I'm ready. Just put that you are excited to dive into the Word of God. If this is your first time with us, we are so grateful that you decided to join us. We, it's always best to do this as a family and with friends. So just uh, tag other friends you may know. Share this so that other people can watch this and hear the Word of God. And we are praying and believing that people will come to faith in Jesus Christ. Well, it's time to dive into the Word, so let's go ahead and grab our Bibles. We'll be in Habakkuk chapter 2. Uh, you know how we do if you join us on a weekly basis. We do stand and read the Word of God, so I'm going to stand up, and we're going to read a Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Uh, here now is the Word of the Lord. I will stand at my guard post and station myself on the lookout tower. I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I should reply about my complaint. The Lord answered me, write down this vision, clearly inscribe it on tablets so one may easily read it. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It testifies about the end and will not lie. Though it delays, wait for it, since it will certainly come and not be late. Look, his ego is inflated. He is without integrity, but the righteous one will live by his faith. Moreover, wine betrays an arrogant man is never at rest. He enlarges his appetite like Sheol, and like death, he is never satisfied. He gathers all the nations to himself. He collects all the peoples for himself. Family, I want us to pray, uh, but, but I, I want to share something the Holy Spirit shared with me during my time this week, just digging into the Word and being on my knees and laying prostrate before the Lord. And, and as we begin to pray for this message, I also want to say a special prayer for singles. The Lord really spoke to me about just praying for singles in this time of quarantine, whereas uh, a lot of couples may have people at the home with him, with them. Uh, there, there are some singles that are home alone. And what I want to do is I want to pray against isolation. Now, now listen, I don't want to deny your feelings. Here's what we say all the time. Feelings are real, but they're not always right. And so some of you may feel isolated, even from your vision family. And I just want, I want us to be reminded that loneliness is a feeling but it's not a reality. Because if you are a believer, you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. So I want to pray for you as we pray over the word. I want to pray a special prayer for our singles, not just here, but all over the world. So let's pray. Father, uh, we love you. Uh, thank you, Jesus, for the beauty of your word. Thank you for the reality of your gospel. Thank you for uh, the fact that you, you show us through the book of Habakkuk that when we pray, you listen and you respond, and you respond according to your will. And so it's, what, what an amazing reality that we pray to God. Not only do you hear us, but you respond to us in a way that will draw us closer to you. Now, God, I want to pray for, for all my singles out there, God. I, I, I want to pray against this, uh, this feeling of isolation, this feeling of uh, loneliness, this idea that some may think that people don't care about them. God, I want to pray against those voices of the enemy that will try to attack them when they're at home or in that bed by themselves at night. Remind them of the love they have around them. Remind them of your love for them, God. Let them know that they are not alone, for you are with them and you are for them, and you love them, God. And so right now, God, just move me out the way. Let us dive into the text. Let us hear from you. Let us uh, grow closer to you and closer to each other, deep in our heart and our passion for the world and for those that are far from you, that we can preach your word to them and draw them, uh, see you draw people to yourself. We ask all this in the matchless name of Jesus. If you agree with that, say amen. Everyone say amen. Just type amen in the comments. Listen, family, as we continue our Really God series, uh, I want to speak from this topic. Watch this. Just type that in the comments if you're with us. Ty type this, watch this. Now, now, watch this is a phrase that we hear a lot. I'm, I'm sure you've heard that phrase before. In fact, if you heard that phrase, just put the little picture where, where the hand is up. Just put that in the comments for me if you can. Uh, watch this is a phrase that we hear a lot. A, a child says, watch this before doing a cartwheel or presenting a, a picture that they created for their parents, right? A, a teacher will say, watch this before showing a math problem or presenting a science experiment. Um, 
A drunk person says, watch this before doing something crazy silly and didn't have any audacity to put it on social media. Uh, But people in my world, you know this, pastors, preachers, and teachers say, watch this before emphasizing a point. The last time we were together, we saw God's watch this. Uh, God's watch this is that he's going to raise up the Chaldeans. He's going to allow this wicked nation to overtake Judah in order to discipline them, but also to draw them back to himself. Uh, Think about this. I I want you to consider something with me. Um, What if we had a proactive watch this? Instead of reacting to someone else's watch this, what if we took a more re, a proactive re- approach and we decided to watch God work while we wait on God? What, what if instead of watching impatiently, instead of watching with this idea of God is taking too long, uh, what, what if we took the posture that we were going to watch with aggression? that we were going to watch with patience, and we were going to watch with expectancy. Remember, we said this, biblical waiting is active, not passive and lifeless. In other words, uh, biblical waiting is not just waiting uh, for the paint to dry or waiting for the stoplight to change. Biblical waiting is this idea of I'm watching, God, I'm watching and waiting for God to work, and I know he's going to respond. And we watch with this idea of expectancy. Uh, think of it this way. Waiting um, is an act of worship. Watching is an act of faith. Let me say that again. Uh, Waiting is an act of worship. Watching is an act of faith. God really cares about how we watch and how we wait on him. Here's the point. How we watch um, and how we wait matters to God. Here's the question. Um, Are you watching and waiting on God? Because that's what we're going to see in the text. Are you watching and waiting on God with an attitude of hope or hopelessness? Are are you watching with uh, ambition or are you apathetic? Are you rejoiceful or are you resentful? Are you compassionate or are you combative? Are you better are you getting bitter? Now, 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 think about that. The difference between better and bitter is one letter. And, and, and I'm going to work hard to change the letters, to change that I of bitter to an E so that you can see that if you watch with the right expectancy, God will make you better. God will build you in him if we can learn how to watch and wait with the right attitude. But let's be honest about those questions of being ambitious or apathetic or rejoiceful or resentful or compassionate or combative. The, the, the answer to that question is yes. Sometimes I'm ambitious and I'm patient, and sometimes I'm impatient. Sometimes I am compassionate, but sometimes I'm combative and I'm ready to verbally fight because I'm just not in the mood. And the reality is we all wrestle with these things, but here's the point of God telling us to watch a certain way and to wait. Here's the point. God wants us, he wants you and me, to divest ourselves of trying to control his narrative. I'm going to say that again. I want you to get that in your spirit. God wants us to divest ourselves of, of trying to control God's narrative. Again, how we watch and how we wait matters. Uh, in 1954, uh, scientists began to do this experiment when they found uh, this chemical that is released in our brain called dopamine. Uh, dopamine u- usually is, re- is released as a, as a result of us experiencing pleasure. But, but as uh, what happened in 1954 is they began to do these experiments. H- here's what they found, that dopamine is not only released after the moment of pleasure, dopamine is released when we anticipate a reward or, a- or the anticipation of of the pleasure. Here's the point. God is saying that God in his infinite wisdom, God who created man from the dust, he's put a chemical in you to say, I want you to expect me to move. I want you to have a dopamine release saying that I'm going to move and I'm going to move in a way that's unpredictable to you, but it'll glorify me and it'll make you better. Again, how we watch and how we make wait Uh, matters to God. We have to have the right posture. We have to have the right attitude. And this is what we're going to see in the text. But when we don't have expectancy, when we watch as if the pain is drying, when we watch as if the traffic light is changing and and we watch impatiently, what happens is doubt settles in. And when doubt settles in, it's almost impossible for us to watch and to wait in a way that honors and glorifies God. Which, which brings us to our thought tattoo for this week. Listen to this. We must watch with a spirit of expectancy, not an attitude of entitlement. 
Let me say that again for the people in the back. (laughs) We must watch with a spirit of expectancy, not an attitude of entitlement. Listen, yes, God will move. And yes, God will respond. We've seen that in chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. But when we become entitled, we think that God owes us something. We begin to think that God is taking too long. We begin to give God a deadline, and we begin to point to our watches and say, God, hurry up. God, move now. God, don't you know you're late as if God is tardy? Because our entitlement tells us that God owes us something. I want to ask you a question. When do you feel the most entitled? Just rest with that for a moment. When do you feel the most entitled? I don't know about you, but I, yes, Pastor Jerome, yes, I feel the most entitled after I go through some serious drama or a tremendous trial. When I go through some drama, I feel like, all right, God, you, you've got to bless me now. I've, I've gone through all of this. I've experienced this trial, and, and I, I just know that you're going to bless me. I, I begin to think that God owes me something. But let, let me just tell you what that is, idolatry. Now, now, now can you relate? Just, again, just lift your hands in the comments if you, if you can relate to what I'm saying. A lot of times when we go through a trial, we think God owes us something. I mean, just, just think about this. You ever gone through something, you're like, like God, I, the, I didn't cuss them out and they earned it. I didn't pay them their wages, God. Matter of fact, I was nice to them when I could have been nasty. I, I responded when I didn't want to. When I could have ignored them, I chose to talk to them. And sometimes we think God owes us something because that's because we're waiting with entitlement instead of expectancy. And God is saying, I want you to have a spirit of expectancy, not an attitude of entitlement, because yes, I'm going to move, but I'm not going to move in a way that's predictable to you. But you just need to put your yes on the table and say yes to my will, yes to my way, yes to whatever it is I'm doing. Just know that when I move, it's going to be in a way that gives me glory and it's going to build you up. And God is saying, that's that's what we need to understand. That's how we need to trust him. And so we said, remember what we said, one of our goals was to learn how to win while we wait. And what chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 is going to show us that Habakkuk shows us that we, we can win while we wait. Let's go through it again, family. Chapter 2, verse 1. I love this. He says, I will stand at my guard post and station myself on the lookout tower. I will watch to see what he will say to me and what I, and what I should reply about my complaint. Here's our first point. Listen to this. My interpretation determines my integration. One more time. My interpretation determines my integration. Now, if we recall, God has responded to Habakkuk once. In chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, God responded to what Habakkuk said in chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Habakkuk then responds again uh, to end chapter 1. And here is, here is Habakkuk saying it again in chapter 2. He's saying he's coming to him again. Now, here are a few things that Habakkuk has questioned. He, he questioned, just like us, God's timing. Remember his first question, how long? You ever said that, God, how, how long uh, before this is going to end? How, how long is my marriage going to be on the rocks? How long are these children going to drive me crazy? How, how, how long am I going to have to deal with this financial struggle? How, how, how long am I going to have to still be single and watch my friends get married? God, how long? He, he, he questioned God's timing. He also questioned God's justice in chapter 1, verse 3. He began to get what we call anthropomorphic and begin to look at the eyes of God. Now, God is spirit, John 4, 24, but, but, but then he, he gives this, these body parts, God's eyes. He talked about God's eyes. He questioned God's mouth. And he said, why are you silent in chapter 1, verse 13? Then he questioned God's response in chapter 1, verse 17. Uh, but now, so, so God moved, right? God told him, all right, you, I heard what you said in verses 1 through 4, and I'm going to move. And so God tells him in verse 5, he tells him to do three things. Look, observe, and be astounded. Again, look, observe, and be astounded. Look, that's where we get, watch this. Look, look at what I'm about to do, and then you're going to be blown away. God, God tells a back man, I'm going to do something you ain't never seen before. I'm going to do something that the world has never seen, and tell me if this sounds familiar. So in verse 1 through 4, God, will you please move? And then God moves, and then you say, God, why'd you move like that? <laughs> Ever been there? God, God, would you please do something? And then you're like, God, why you do that? <laughs> And that's the human experience, right? We want to predict God's move. We, we want to determine. We think we know what's best for us. We think we know the discipline we need. We think we know when we need what we want. And God says, no, 
I created you from dust. I spoke the earth into existence. I know you better than you know you because I created you. So trust me even with you. And that's what he teaches us here. Uh, So I love this because what verse 1 in chapter 2 teaches us, Habakkuk decides to do something. Habakkuk says, I'm going to watch. He says, I'm going to watch. Now, remember, again, uh, God told him, watch, observe, and be shocked or be astounded. So Habakkuk says he's going to watch, and he says, I'm going to go to a guard post or a watch post, or some version says, watch towers. Now, here's an important point. This is a place of instruction. The watchtower was a place of instruction, and so he says, I'm going to go to this place, but the watchtower represents several things. Number one, instruction. Typically, a man was told to go to this watchtower and to begin to look out. The second thing the watchtower represents is preparation. Um, they, they would go to this watchtower, and they would see if an, uh, if an enemy was coming towards them. They would be prepared for battle. Also, sometimes friends or family would come through a certain entrance. But whatever it was, the watchtower was a place of instruction, but it's also a place of preparation. God is preparing you for something. If you can learn how to watch him work while you wait. The third thing the watchtower represents is protection. Uh, the watchmen, the watchmen would warn others, hey, hey, danger is coming. A battle is coming. The people we have contention with, beef with, they're, they're, they're coming. So I want you to be ready. The fourth thing is, I love this. Now, please don't miss this because what Habakkuk says is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to my watchtower and I'm going to stand. The watchtower represents a position. Here's what he's saying. God, uh, I, I didn't like what you said. I don't like the fact that you're going to raise up the Chaldeans, people that are more wicked than Judah. I don't like that, but, but I'm not going to run from you. Uh, let, let that be your testimony that, that, that God, I, I may not like your answer. I may be wrestling with, remember Habakkuk's name means to wrestle. I may be living with the tension where uh, my experience doesn't match my belief. But, but even though I don't feel like doing this, God, I'm going to stand still. God, I'm going to stay right here. God, I'm going to stand in a watchtower. I'm going to wait. I'm going to fight through my impatience. I'm going to wait and I'm going to watch you move. And family, that's, that's the attitude we need to have. Remember, we need to have a spirit of expectancy, uh, not an attitude of entitlement. And so here's what he does. He says, I'm going to stand here. I'm going to watch. And and, and here's the thing, because, again, the point is my interpretation determines determines my, uh, my integration. Listen, if I don't interpret what God is doing the right way, I'm not going to the watchtower to wait. I'm going somewhere else. When I, when, remember, my interpretation determines my integration. What happens is I will integrate doubt if I don't interpret God the right way. I will integrate despondency if I don't interpret God the right way. I will in, integrate depression. And listen, I know depression is a real thing, and we're not denying that, that, that there's a clinical depression. But, but sometimes our depression is a result of our disobedience because we simply won't wait on the Lord. Listen, listen to me, family. Get this. It's not the incident. It's your interpretation of the incident that determines if you're faithful or not. Your interpretation of what God, uh, your interpretation of what God is to- doing determines your integration, which will affect how you respond to him. Here's the point, family. If I interpret him rightly, I'll be more devoted. If I interpret him incorrectly, I'll deviate. The choice is yours. Devotion or deviation? Listen to me. Devotion or deviation? How you watch God move will either lead to devotion or deviation. Listen, if if I constantly interpret what God is doing the wrong way, Now, listen to me. If I interpret 51% of what God is doing in my life negatively, I'm going to run from him because I'm interpreting him more incorrectly than I am correctly. And and, and if if just 51%, if if more than half of my interpretation is God is always punishing me, God is always playing with me, God is always just making fun of me. We we think like, like Naomi did in the book of Ruth where she says, the hand of the Lord is against me. And some, sometimes we interpret, we integrate that incorrect interpretation. And what happens is when I do that, I deviate from God and I slide in someone's DMs. You up? Hey. And there's some husbands watching right now and you deviating. 
And God is saying, he's convicting you. He wants, to, he wants you to change. There's some single women right now who, who, who are you're saying you love God, but you're deviating because you've been single so long. And you respond. Maybe you received the DM. Maybe you uh, sent it. You're deviating. You'll deviate. God is saying, if, 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 you're not, if you don't interpret me the right way, you'll deviate. But if you interpret me the right way, you'll become more devoted. So, so how, how can I keep away from the DMs or depression or, listen, apathy? Again, if I interpret 51% of what God is doing, meaning most of the time I think God is against me, it's going to lead to the DMs, it's going to lead to depression, it's going to lead to apathy. So here's the question, family. Pastor Jerome, I hear you, but here's my question, and I would have the same question if I was on the other end watching this. How do I stop? How do I stop deviating and I grow more devoted? Listen to me. You have to get the right interpreter. Listen, uh, Corona messed up our mission trip this year. We were supposed to go uh, to Ghana and, uh, uh, you know, and, and not just Ghana, but I plan on going to other places. I, I really hope to go overseas. One, one of my dreams is to go overseas and minister. And, and what I want to do is, is I want to minister and I want to have one of those interpreters. Like, like I want to say something and then another person say, say what I just said in a different language, even though I don't know what they're saying. I just want to see them have the same passion that I have in their language, right? And so, you know, I dream of this day of preaching and having an interpreter. Uh, but the question is, you know, how do you know when you have a good interpreter, right? Like if I say 10 words and they only say two words, that's probably not a good interpreter. <laughs> but if, and, and if I say two words and they say 10 words, that's probably not a good interpreter. Here's the point. If, if you have an interpreter that's saying that you need to be more doubtful, if you need to be despondent, if you need to be depressed, if you need to be hateful, if you need to, if you need to isolate yourself, you need to fire your interpreter. You need to fire the interpreter of doubt. You need to fire the interpreter that will tell you to deviate from God because God's not going to respond to you. Some of you need to fire your interpreter because the interpreter, the voice in your head, is telling you to go against God because God is not responding when you want him to. Fire your interpreter of doubt and hire the interpreter of faith that says God is at work even when you don't see it. That's what God is saying to us. That's how God is challenging us right now. That's how God is speaking and how he speaks to us through this text right here. Some of you need to fire your interpreter now. Matter of fact, just type that now, right? Today, I'm firing my interpreter of doubt. Today, I'm firing that interpreter. And listen, when they fill out an application to come back in, don't allow it. Because listen, I know. And this is not a game. I mean, well, you, you can type fired, but it's still the thoughts still come back. But listen, you have the power to fight. If you are in Christ, you have the power and the authority to fight. And too many of us aren't living like it. See, Habakkuk says, I'm going to stand here. I don't like what's happening. But I'm going to go to this watchtower. I'm going to stand and I'm going to watch. Again, my interpretation determines my integration. Now, let's, let's use some biblical examples. Think about Abraham. Old. No Viagra back then. Man, how am I going to have a baby? I'm old, as old as I am. Even, even Sarah doubted. She says, hm. the Bible says, she literally says this, can I have pleasure in my old age? Uh, Sarah essentially told God, boy, bye. <laughs> ain't, ain't, ain't no way I'm going to have pleasure this, this old, but, but at this age. But here's, here's the thing. Here's what we got to ask. See, if, if I can have the right interpretation and I have the right integration, is God denying him a child or is he developing his faith while he waits? The choice is yours. Think, think about Joseph, right? We, we always talk about Joseph, and we always go to what well, God meant for evil, you meant for my good, but, and that's in there. But that's not the only thing that's in there. No, notice, when you go back and read it, Joseph says this, God sent me. See, see if you integrate the right interpretation, his brothers, yes, they did sell him into slavery, but because God redeemed it, he says, no, God sent me, and now I'm second in command. See, if you can just change that perspective, you'll see God work, and you'll see God move. I, I read this story about a man in a wheelchair, and he, had been, he was being interviewed, and the interviewer asked him, how does it feel to be confined to a wheelchair? And I love his response. He says this, I'm not confined to my wheelchair. I am liberated by it. 
if I was if it wasn't for my wheelchair, I would be bed bound and never able to leave my house. You see that shifting perspective? How, you see how your interpretation determines your integration. And some of you, you need to repent for being so cynical. Because you're so cynical, you see a lot of what God is doing negatively, and you see people negatively. And God is saying, I just want you to shift your perspective on this. Now, now I know the cynical person, you, you'll say this, yeah, but, but some people are bedridden. And, and, and I want to come back and say that the bedridden person can say, I'm not in the grave. And then you'll say, what about the person in the grave? Well, if the person was in Christ and in the grave, they can quote Corinthians, death, where is your sting? Because death is not the infinite. Listen, the point is this, Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, there is always something worthy of praise. There's always something we can rejoice about. And we just need to shift the perspective and watch with expectancy, knowing that God will move. Again, your interpretation determines your integration. And today, you can break free from seeing most of your life through a cynical and a negative lens by changing two percentage points. Pastor Jerome, what you talking about? I, I, my goal, I want you to change two percentage points. In other words, I want you to go from 49% of trusting God to 51%. Pastor Ron, what do, you, what do you mean? Now listen, I'm not talking about sinning 49% of the time. I'm talking about how you interpret what God is doing. If I can get you at 51%, that means you're going to interpret what he's doing positively most of the time so you'll be more devoted than you are in, into deviation. God wants to bring us back. God, just, just if I can change those two percentage points of you looking at your singleness negatively, looking at your marriage negatively, looking at your job negatively, looking at your finances negatively, if I can just change that to 50 51% that God is still at work, and I'm waiting, and I'm watching for him to move. Listen, your interpretation determines your integration. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 says it this way, let us not get tired of doing good, for if we do good, we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Don't quit. Chapter 2, verse 2, the Lord answered, uh, write down this vision clearly and inscribe it on tablets. That one, so one uh, may easily read it, for the vision is yet for an appointed time. It testifies about the end and will not lie. Though it delays, wait for it, since it certainly uh, will come at, and not be late. Here's our next point. God's vision for your life is not about your life. God's vision for your life is not about your life. Listen, uh, God responds with this famous passage that is often taken out of context, right? A lot of times when we hear this, write the vision, make it plain. We think the vision is ours, but, but look at verse 2. The Lord answered me. The vision was God's. Not, not this personal vision, not that personal visions are bad, not that having a vision board, like, but most of the time we hear that verse, we think about our vision board and, and the things we want to do. And listen, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not the context of this verse. God is saying, all right, th this, this vision, I'm going to tell you my vision for your life. See, God's vision for your life is not about your life. It's about what he wants to do through your life. So it's about him. And that's what we got to understand, God's vision for my life. And so I, I love this because here's, here's what God tells him to do. Now, now, now picture this. God says, all right, write the vision. So remember, he's in this watchtower, and God is like, all right, I, I'm about to talk to you again. All right, I already answered you, but here it comes again. I'm getting ready to talk to you. And so Habakkuk's like, yeah, all right, boom. Then he got it. So I got, got his pen ready, and he, he got his pad ready just like you. And, you know, God, you ever been there? And you're like, all right, God, I'm, I'm here. And, and God is like, are you ready, Habakkuk? And Habakkuk like, ready, ready. All right, I'm getting ready to speak. All right, all right speak to me, guys. All right, I got it. All right, all right, God. God, speak to me. And God says, write this down. All right, I'm going to write this down. And he writes, and God says, write down, wait. And then Habakkuk's like, say it with me. Really, God? That's all you got to say? Wait. And one other thing, be faithful. Wait and be faithful. See, why did God tell Habakkuk to write it down? Well, number one, permanence. God's plan isn't going to change. When you write something down, especially during those times, there was this idea, there was a permanent aspect of it. But here's the second thing, preservation. Listen, God's vision for your life is not about your life. If you live for God, what God does through you will outlive you. And that's how we all should live. I want everything God does through me to outlive me because everything he does through me is not about me. And that's how God wants you and I to live. Listen, this is not the first time God 
tells a prophet to write. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 8. Go now, write it on a tablet in their presence and inscribe it on a scroll. It will be for, for the future, forever and ever. So he tells them to write because it's permanent uh, for preservation. But then listen to this because it's personal. He says, write it so it can be read by others. In other words, this vision, Habakkuk, is not just about you. Any vision that's just about you isn't a big enough vision, and it's not from God. God, A vision from God adds value to others because that's the type of God that we serve, right? Here's the other thing about it being personal. He says, all right, write, write, grab your pen, write the vision, make it plain that others may run with it. But, but here's the thing. I want you to think about this. The Bible tells us this in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2. It says this, you yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. Another version says this, we are living epistles to be read by men. Here's the question. What type of book is your life writing? Is it an autobiography where you do all the writing? Is it a biography when God writes for you? Or is it fiction? You being fake. You know, I, I struggle with people where all of their struggles are in the past tense. That's fiction. God is saying, I don't, I don't want you to write an autobiography. I don't want you to write fiction. I want to be, I want to write a biography. I want to control your narrative. And if you let me control your narrative, watch this. Watch what I do through you. What are you waiting for? Some of us are waiting for apologies from people. We're waiting for our anxiety to end. We're waiting for our marriages to get better. Some of you are unemployed, and you're waiting for an employer to call. And listen, there's nothing wrong to keep praying for God to come through. But listen, watch and wait well. Now, family, um, y'all know how we roll here, right? Like when we read the Bible, we want to be Christians that think. And so I want you to go back and read verse 3 again because I got a question. Because the Bible says this, um, though it is delayed, it won't be late. So here's my question. How is it delayed, but not late? And now, now I, I've traveled, and so I've, I've been on a, uh, planes, and every now and then my flight has been delayed. And when the flight was delayed, I got to my destination at a later time. So God, remember, he's daddy. Daddy, look, I'm confused. Like, you know, we, we can talk to God like this. God, I'm confused. How, how is it delayed? But then he, at the end of the verse, he says, it won't be late. Well, because he, here's what's in that verse. It says an appointed time. An appointed time is the Hebrew word moed. Say that with me. Say moed. One more time. Get, get your babies to say it. Moed. All right. Uh, moed. Listen, moed means this, the unstoppable timing of God. So, so when he says there were delays, what he's saying is you may interpret it as a delay. You think I'm taking too long. The reason that the word de delay is in there is because, because we may think it's taking too long, but God is saying, no, uh, my moed can't be stopped. My moed can't be rushed. My moed is never late. I'm always an on-time God. I like the way the old folks used to say it. He may not come when you want him, but you're going to want him when he comes. <laughs> I love that. And, and so th this, is, this, is what, this is what he's, he's doing and, and showing us here in the text. Listen, God's timing is unpredictable, but his integrity is impeccable. We, we can trust him. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18 says it this way, because the end of the verse says, uh, it talks about God won't lie. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 18 says this, so that through two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. I want, to hear, I want you to hear that. It is impossible for God to lie. We who have fled for refuge might not have strong encouragement to seize the hope that is set before us. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4. Then he transitions here. Look, his ego is inflated. He is without integrity, but the righteous one will live by faith. That sound familiar? The righteous one will live by faith, which brings us to our next point. Listen to me, family, please get this. Focus on him, not them. Let me say it again. Focus on him, not them. I don't know who your them is or who your them are, 
but focus on him, not them. What's the point? What, what he's saying is he's contrasting the people of God versus the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, same, same group of people. He, he's contrasting. He says, listen, I, I know what, that, what they do. I know how they live, but I, c- c- come on back. The righteous one, my people, we live by faith. And so even though what we're hoping God for hasn't come to pass, I'm not going to deviate into the DMs. I'm, I'm refusing to go that way. I'm going to stand flat for it and trust God. Focus on him, not them. Let's be honest. The, the Bible even talks about this in Psalm 73. Uh, uh, David said, I, I, I looked at how the wicked prosper. Let, let's be honest. We, we compare. Right, right now, you, 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 uh, again, God has really put singles on my heart, and some of you are looking at, 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 at singles, and, and in the back of your head, you're like, she trifling. How she get mad? I know, I know you, you, you don't want to admit it, but some of you real enough with me, but, but we said we're not going to be fake. We're not, we're not going to write fiction novels. We, we're going to let write biographies where God controls our narrative. And, and sometimes we look at people and we're like, how did she get married? How did he get married? How did they get that promotion? How did they move up and I get fired? How, 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 did, how, did, how did their baby make it and mine didn't? Right? And so what he says, listen, the, the, the faith is not being fake. God, I'm, I'm, I'm hurt that I lost my child. God, God I'm, I'm hurt. I love my baby, but, but it's challenging raising a child with autism. God, 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 I need you to come through financially. I'm, I'm struggling. And God, you can even say, God, I'm beginning to lose hope. I'm beginning to, to deviate, God, and I need you to reel me back in. God says you you can you can be completely uncensored, and He can handle the uncensored version of you. He can handle it, cause He got you. You got to focus on Him, not them. Especially in the midst of a trial, when you begin to feel entitled, you got to focus on Him, not them. God says I'm doing the work in you, in Judah. I'm disciplining you because I love you. That's what it says in Hebrews. But don't worry. Remember what he already, he already said in chapter 1. They're guilty. The, the, the wicked aren't getting away with anything. They're not really prospering. We should never envy them. We should feel sorry for them. Because, because remember what God said about them in chapter 1. He said, their strength is their God. If their strength is their God, that means God is not their God. So when they stand before God, they don't have the blood of Jesus as protection. But you and I do if we're in Christ. And we can rest in that. He said the Chaldeans are guilty. He said their strength is their God. And remember, God will take care of the wicked. He'll humble them. One of the Babylonian leaders, Chaldean leaders, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heavens because all of his works are true and his ways are just. Listen to what Nebuchadnezzar said in Daniel chapter 4, verse 37. He is able to humble those who walk in pride. James says it this way, James chapter 4, verse 6, but he gives greater grace Therefore, he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And he said that famous verse, the just shall live by faith. This is said several times in the New Testament. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. That's where Paul got it from. But listen, listen. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 5. Moreover, wine betrays an arrogant man is never at rest. He enlarges his appetite like Sheol and death. He is never satisfied. He gathers all the nation to himself. He collects all the peoples for himself. Last point, the consequences will always outweigh the pleasure of the moment. Family, please get this. The consequences will always outweigh the pleasure of the moment. I tell men I disciple this all the time. You can control your decision but you can't control the consequences. Let me say it again. You you can control your decision. You choose to slide in a woman's DM that's not your wife. You choose to keep looking at that website. You choose to keep operating in secrecy. You you can do. You you can do what you want. But what you can't control, you can't control the consequences that come back to you. And this is what the Babylonians don't understand. Their strength is their God. So he's saying the wine, these things betray them. And that's why he uses, he talks about Sheol, which represents death. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 15 says, three things are never satisfied. Four never say enough. Sheol, a childless womb. Earth, 
which is never satisfied with water, and fire, which is never says enough. Listen, I, I, our desires are insatiable. That means they're never satisfied. Listen, whatever or whoever you hope in, listen to me. If it's not your creator, it or they will fail you every time. If it's not him, whatever it is or whoever they are will fail you every time. And so God is saying, Habakkuk, listen, I got them. Focus on him, not them, and realize the consequences of what you do will always outweigh the temporary pleasure it may provide. But then he says something interesting. He said, wine betrays them. There was someone else who was betrayed. Mark chapter 14, verse 18, while they were reclining and eating, Jesus said, truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who was eating with me. Luke chapter 22, verse 48, but Jesus said to them, Judas, you, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Notice he says that wine betrays the Chaldeans. In other words, the thing they seek pleasure in betrays them. But our Savior was betrayed, listen, because of us and for us. Jesus says, you betrayed me. My disciples fell asleep on me moments before I went to the cross. You've made promise to me. You watching this, this man preaching right now. I can't even count how many promises I broke into God. How many times I said, God, this is the last time. And I went to that website again. I did that thing I said I'd never do again. I betrayed God. But instead, God says, I, even though you betrayed me, I'll endure this betrayal to redeem you. Wine betrays them. Jesus was betrayed for us. So what do we do with this family? Three things we got to remember. Number one, we must watch and wait patiently. Number two, we must watch and wait with the right perspective. Remember, I need you, those two percentage points, I need you to be at 51%. I'm not talking about sinning 49% of the time, but 51% integrate the right interpretation. Last thing, we must watch and wait at the right pace. Stop comparing your season to someone else's finished product. Stop looking at your season and comparing it to someone else's. Their life is their life. Your life is yours, and you need to live for him. Remember, the moed, the unstoppable timing of God. The moed can't be rushed. And the moed won't be late. We must watch with a spirit of expectancy, not an attitude of entitlement. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, God. You are a good God. We love you. We're grateful and thankful that you paid the ultimate price. And right now, God, I just I, I feel your presence. I, I hear you speaking, God, and, and, and again, you keep coming back to singles right now, and, and not, not, not that obviously families matter, but God, God, just encourage them, strengthen them, equip them, remind them that you love them. Let, 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 Father, let, let married couples at Vision just say, let, let, let me re- reach out to some, some, some of the singles right now. C- convict us that, that we're, we're not so focused on homeschool that we forget that there's family members around us struggling. God, and right now I pray for the person who's watching this that does not know you. God, let this be the moed where there's time for them to stop pursuing things and people and to give their lives to you. And I want to pray that you would do that right now. I'm still praying. I'm looking at you, but I'm still praying. Listen, right right now you can trust Jesus. And and just say this. say, Say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner in need of grace, and I thank you for saving me. Listen, we'll have something in the comments. We want to follow up with you. You see our vision. Glorify God. Make disciples. We want to watch, walk with you. And family, as we continue to pray, God, just move by your spirit. We thank you and we love you. Help us to wait and watch well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Vision and Vision Virtual, I love you. I'll see you next week.